The term welfare biology is used for a proposed field of study that would examine all the factors affecting the well-being of animals, especially those living outside human control. Research in this area is still very limited. It remains a very new field of study. More technically, it can be defined as follows. Welfare biology is the study of sentient living beings with respect to their positive and negative well-being. In principle, welfare biology concerns the well-being of all animals, whether they live in captivity or outside of human control. However, its main task would be assessing what the lives of animals in the wild are like and ways of reducing the harms they suffer. This is because, given the complexity of ecosystemic relations, it's much more complex to learn what the best courses of action might be to help animals in the wild. For this reason, it's an area where studies in biology and more specifically in ecology are crucial. We may not need to know how ecosystems work in order to know that a dog is suffering in a cage and will be better off if we free her, but we need to know how ecosystems work in order to know if a certain change in an ecosystem will likely result in more or less suffering overall for the animals in it. So we can say that welfare biology would primarily, though not necessarily only, study wild animal suffering and that one of its main goals would be to inform policies to prevent the harms they suffer. The term welfare biology has sometimes been used in a different sense, meaning using the science of ecology to improve human well-being. However, a better term for that field would be human welfare biology. Literally, the term welfare biology means research in biology about welfare, so there is nothing in the term to limit the relevant welfare to humans alone. Because the point of welfare biology is to study the welfare of sentient living beings, it is not primarily concerned with other questions that are not directly related. Accordingly, it doesn't consider animals as mere representatives of their species or population group or as units of an ecosystem. Rather, it would be focused on animals as sentient individuals and on what could be good or bad for them as individuals. We now know that the term wild animal welfare science can be used for the study of the well-being of undomesticated animals. This can be seen as part of the work of animal welfare science. However, work in this field has mostly focused on animals in captivity, seldom considering animals living outside human control. Despite this, much of the work that has been done in this field can be applied to animals in the wild. To start with, existing knowledge about what kinds of things can positively or negatively affect animals in captivity can be extrapolated to other animals in similar situations. This is pretty clear when the animals are the same species or closely related ones. Even when this is not the case, some of the findings can help us to make informed guesses when it comes to other animals. Now let's consider ways of assessing the well-being of animals who live outside human control. As mentioned before, animal welfare science integrates methods from very different approaches. This is because it considers several different criteria or indicators in order to assess animals' well-being. The most important ones include physiological and behavioral assessments of how animals may be feeling. Physiological assessments consider factors related to the state of the animals' bodies. They include parameters concerning the health of the animals and indicators showing the animals' physiological states when they are in certain situations. They include, for example, heart rate variations, temperature, and corticosteroid levels. The idea here is twofold. First, when an animal's health is bad, the animal could be in pain. Second, when animals are distressed or in pain, it could also affect their physiology. Behavioral assessments consider what animals' behavior can tell us about the way they feel. We're all familiar with making such assessments of the individuals who surround us. Animal welfare science makes these assessments in more rigorous ways, using knowledge of how animals of a different species behave when they are feeling well or ill. In addition to this, animal welfare assessments can include considerations of how external factors affect the animals. These include the availability of the resources animals need to live, such as food and water, shelter to mitigate the impact of weather conditions, and others related to their particular environments. By examining the conditions animals live in, it is possible to make estimations of how they feel. One way is by studying animals' preferences for certain situations or places over others. This combines an assessment of external factors with an assessment of the animal's behavior. It serves as, a, as an indicator of what kind of environments are more likely to make them suffer or feel well. We've talked about the need to expand wild animal welfare work so it covers animals living outside human control. However, this is only a part of the work that could be incorporated within the field of welfare biology. 
This is because the methods of animal welfare science are focused primarily on the state the animals are in and how the circumstances animals face affect their well-being. But it doesn't explain how such circumstances end up the way they are. In order to know this, we need to understand how animals living in the wild are affected by their physical environment and by other living organisms in ways that are good or bad for them. Also, the study of other factors, including their population dynamics and life histories, can help us in making estimations of the average well-being of different animal populations or species. This is where ecology is crucially needed. The study of the ways ecosystems are and evolve has been approached from many different perspectives by ecologists, giving rise to different fields within ecology, including population ecology, community ecology, systems ecology, and landscape ecology. The factors that are relevant for each of them are diverse, and together they cover a large portion of the possible ways we could approach the study of ecosystems. However, the well-being of animals has not been one of those factors. We still lack an understanding of how ecosystems work in relation to the well-being of their members. Welfare biology would fill this gap. It's important to note here that, as with animal welfare science, we already have a substantial amount of knowledge from ecology that could be applied to make estimates of the suffering of animals in different situations. To start with, there are some fields, such as population dynamics and life history theory, that are highly relevant to making estimations about what the proportion of suffering compared to positive welfare in the wild might be. We've seen a great deal of information concerning the suffering of these animals. That information was just a short summary of a large body of scientific literature in biology that can inform us about the lives of animals in the wild. In light of this, we might wonder in what sense the kind of work proposed here would be original. The answer to this question is simple. So far, all the available information that is relevant for wild animal suffering has been gathered not out of an interest about the animal's well-being, but out of other concerns. As a result, while such research already contains information from which it is possible to draw sound inferences about the suffering of animals, such inferences were previously not made. For example, traditionally, scientific articles examining how many animals starve to death or die due to cold in a certain population in a particular location did not consider the question of the suffering this meant for the animals involved. Nevertheless, given what we know about the suffering caused by dying in those ways, we can infer from them that the animals involved probably suffered a great deal. Unfortunately, in many studies, much more information could have been gathered that would have been relevant for estimating the well-being of animals, if there had been an interest in this question. Establishing the field of welfare biology would allow for research to be done from this new viewpoint. Nevertheless, at this point, even just literature reviews of the research already done would provide important information. In light of what we have just been considering, we can see that welfare biology would be a cross-disciplinary field involving various other disciplines, including especially the sciences of ecology and animal welfare. In fact, these two sciences are themselves cross-disciplinary. Some other fields would also be involved, such as zoology and ethology. Other disciplines from which we can incorporate knowledge are environmental management and what is called wildlife management. The purpose of these two applied fields is to guide decisions about how to best act in different ecosystems. To date, the ends of such actions have been to further human interests or conservationist aims, but there is nothing essential to the kind of knowledge associated with these disciplines that restricts its application to the pursuit of these aims alone. Instead, we can apply such knowledge in the most effective ways to help animals living in the wild. It can also help us to compare different ways ecosystems might evolve with or without our help and how different scenarios would affect the well-being of animals. In addition, welfare biology could be informed by social sciences, just as conservation biology is. The current academic system tends to classify knowledge into specialized domains. However, for decades, there has been increasing enthusiasm for interdisciplinary research. Welfare biology might start as a cross-disciplinary research program within the biological sciences, but could eventually become large and mature enough to develop into its own discipline. The point at which a certain field is no longer considered to be just an intersection of other disciplines and is considered a discipline on its own is not clearly defined, though there are some factors that can indicate when it reaches that point. They include the organization of international conferences, the creation of specific academic journals to publish studies on them, their inclusion with their own names as areas of study in academic curricula, and the publication of handbooks for students focused on them. 
As welfare biology develops, subfields could include, for example, welfare ecology, focused on the part of welfare biology more concerned with how animals' relationships with their environments affect their well-being. Urban welfare biology, focused on animals living outside of human control in urban or suburban ecosystems. And applied welfare biology, focused not so much on diagnosis of the well-being of animals, but on ways to improve it that can guide our actual policies and interventions. Wild animal welfare science could be another one of these subfields.